What is up guys, Tristendo here. Apple blew away the minds of creative professionals around the world with the introduction of Apple Silicon in their lineup of Mac computers. In late 2021, they introduced their first true Pro machine with the form of the MacBook Pro 14 inch and MacBook Pro 16 inch. It's 2023 now and the new M2 Pro and M2 Max MacBook Pros are out. Is it worth getting these or should you save your money on the older models? Let's tech it out. When it comes to what's new with most products, the most obvious telltale sign that something is new is when it actually looks like something has changed physically in the hardware. The MacBook Pro 14 inch and 16 inch bring a whole new redesign finally ever since the last design refresh back in 2016. For old school Mac fans, this design might look pretty familiar. It's very reminiscent of the PowerBooks back in the day with its squared off edges and boxy look which makes the Macs look bulkier than the more elegant tapered edges that MacBooks had years prior. For reference, I upgraded to the 14 inch model during a Black Friday sale in 2022 and upgraded from an M1 13 inch MacBook Pro. Now that last laptop was a great computer and for most things I can still get by with it, but when compared to the 14 inch, the differences in feature and power are just too staggering to ignore. All this is to say that I noticed the design differences right away. The extra inch is really noticeable. Yet it maintains the same portable form factor as the 13 inch MacBook. Think of the MacBook Pro 14 inch as just a slightly heavier MacBook Pro 13 inch. It has been able to fit in the same sleeves and my same backpack with ease, which was something that concerned me before upgrading. The build quality is still amazing and is one of the best laptops in terms of build quality. There are barely any flex on the body, the hinge is sturdy, and everything is beautiful from the keyboard, Apple logo, even the flush black screws on the back. The MacBook Pro logo moved from the front to an etched wording on the bottom, which I really like, as it looks super clean. Some might even say this design is top notch. <laughs> Speaking of the notch, yes, new MacBook Pro models are going to have this going forward into the foreseeable future. Is it big and looks like it's going to house a Face ID camera? Yes. Does it have Face ID? No. The notch doesn't bother me, but that may also be because of the fact I use an app called Top Notch that makes it disappear and blend seamlessly into the top. Even without this app, the notch wouldn't bother me as 99% of the time you aren't even looking at the top and you eventually ignore it. Also, going to full screen for anything makes the notch disappear, so there's also that. My main guess for why Apple included the notch is so that it also matches the design language of its other products, like the iPhone, and so that one day maybe the Face ID will be included in a future iteration. Ah, only time will tell. It's also a marketing tactic so that anyone who sees one will instantly know that's a MacBook Pro. For now, it does have the decade trusted Touch ID in the power button of the keyboard and it is as reliable as it always has been. Oh yeah, the keyboard. It's a decent keyboard, especially for a laptop. Apple calls it a mechanical keyboard, but enthusiasts would scoff at this as it doesn't really feel like a real mechanical keyboard. What it does offer is a full height function row, much deeper key travel than in years past, good riddance to that butterfly keyboard, and introduces a black interlay beneath the keyboard that really makes it stand out. It's also backlit and got rid of the touch bar from the previous models, which as much as I wanted to love the touch bar, many hated it and for me it was just there and no one including Apple found a good use out of it. Ports. Oh these beautiful ports. <laughs> we shouldn't need to thank Apple for bringing back something that they took away but I am grateful regardless. On the older 13 inch MacBook Pro M1 I only had two USB-C ports on the left for charging to use peripherals. Two. To be fair, I use a docking station to mitigate this and use one USB-C port for everything from charging to plugging in accessories, but when I'm out and about and I have to fend for myself and bring dongles with me, look, we Apple sheep can pretend we like this, that it was okay because USB-C was the future, but for most people, this is a huge hassle and I'm glad we got ports back, especially if, oh, well, I don't know, I wanted to plug something into the right side of the computer and not the left. 
Apple brought back the HDMI port, MagSafe 3, three Thunderbolt USB-C ports, and my personal favorite, the SD card reader. I never stopped using SD cards, so this is my favorite port. Some might have reported on this model that the SD card reader has gone out on them, but it hasn't happened to me yet. SD card readers are almost a must for creative professionals, so this was a smart move to make from Apple. HDMI is only the 2.0 standard, so don't expect to use this port to output 4K at 120Hz or even 8K, which is available on the newer M2 Pro MacBook Pros. But you can output 4K at 60 and 1440p at 120Hz. For anything higher, you will need to use a Thunderbolt USB-C port and a hub or a dongle of some kind. This port is helpful for presentations in business or if you need to present something in front of a classroom, for example. MagSafe 3 is nice. For those who have never got to experience it back in 2015 and before, it essentially fast charges your Mac and has an LED to indicate charging. Its genius inception was that if someone were to trip on the charger while it's connected to your Mac, it would simply disconnect instead of taking the entire MacBook with it. The third iteration has magnets that feel ever so slightly stronger than in MagSafe 2. The biggest change is the braided cable which, if you own the previous MagSafe chargers or any default Apple charger, they begin to fray and break down over time. The braided MagSafe 3 cable is flexible, more resistant, lightweight, and is detachable with a USB-C connector on the end, meaning you can use any USB-C power adapter. The three Thunderbolt USB-C ports are similar to last gen. You can charge the MacBook Pro through these as well, though fast charging isn't available through these. Only MagSafe 3 can fast charge at 93 watts. You can transfer data, connect peripherals, and so on. This is the most advanced port selection on a MacBook Pro yet, so there's hope for the future. No USB-A though. Apple can't give us everything. Oh, that would be too much. <laughs> If you were to ever see one of these in person, I would say the display is what will convince people to get one the most. It is gorgeous. There are other laptops in the market today that can compete now with this display, but the overall balance of pixel density, color, size, brightness, and refresh rate all culminate to create a stunning screen. A huge part of this is that the display uses mini LED technology. If you are familiar with OLED screens, the quality is very close to OLED with deep blacks, rich saturated colors, and brightness. The display is capable of HDR with up to a thousand nits, featuring what Apple calls ProMotion, which is essentially their way of saying adaptive refresh rate. What this means is that the screen feels super smooth and can jump from 10 hertz to 120 hertz when needed. Once you get used to this refresh rate, going back to an older model will feel jarring in comparison. Scrolling Safari or Chrome is buttery smooth, transitioning between apps somehow feels even faster, and animations feel like they're moving in real time. The camera can't do justice, and I totally recommend checking this screen out in person. I even use it sometimes as a monitor for my Steam Deck. A video for that will be coming at a later date. This is the best panel a creative professional could go with, and I can attest to that. A laptop can look as pretty as can be, but there's no point to the aesthetic of a device if it can't pull its own weight. Luckily, Apple took a reverse approach and with the added weight and thickness of the MacBook Pro 14 inch came ports as well as power. You can equip it with an entire M1 Pro chip or an M1 Max chip. My model is the base M1 Pro with an 8-core CPU and 14-core GPU with 16 gigabytes of RAM, but you can go all the way to the M1 Max chip with 64 gigs of RAM, or unified memory as Apple calls it. If you are an amateur in video editing, photo editing, coding, then the base model 14-inch will be more than enough. In fact, if you're looking at this laptop with the mindset you'll just be doing word processing, light video editing, photo editing every now and then, the base model M2 MacBook Air will be a better and cheaper option for you. Now, I know that not every professional is a video editor, but as someone who runs a photography and videography business and running a YouTube channel, the MacBook Pro 14 inch is a machine that excels and more in video editing. This is because there are custom video encoders and decoders in the M1 Pro and more in the M1 Max chips inside the MacBook Pro 14 inch. 
I personally use Final Cut Pro, and this will be the smoothest video editing experience as it is native to Apple Silicon software, and it is a first-party application made directly from Apple. In the years that the M1 chip has been out, other video editing applications have caught up and optimized their apps for Apple Silicon Macs, such as DaVinci Resolve and Adobe Premiere. In my experience, Adobe Premiere Pro will perform the least effective when compared to the performance on Final Cut Pro and DaVinci Resolve on the Mac Pro 14-inch. If you do use these programs, you will still have an amazing experience and the 14-inch will cut through raw 4K footage with plugins, layers on the timeline, and more like butter. It's actually mind-boggling how Apple was able to do this and this is on a base model. Where the MacBook Pro 14-inch will lack in power, most would be in anything GPU intensive. Think AutoCAD software, 3D animation apps like Blender or gaming. Don't get me wrong, this laptop can handle all the mentioned apps, but they won't perform as well as a beefy GPU inside a gaming laptop. What you get in return for the balance of power instead of brute force in the GPU is way less heat, improved battery life, and quiet fans. These are quality of life improvements that Apple Silicon brings that most people won't even know until they use it. A great example of this is the MacBook Pro 14 inch outperforming a $3,000 2019 Intel MacBook Pro 16 inch. This model is a top of the line Intel 16 inch with 64 gigs of RAM and an Intel Core i9. For $2,000 or less, you're getting better performance than the 16 inch and on top of that, it produces way less heat, no audible fan noise and way better battery life. I used the 16 inch MacBook Pro Intel Core i9 for reference and forgot just how much heat and fan noise comes from the device when it's just sitting idle or opening, oh, I don't know, three or four Chrome tabs. Like, seriously? Battery life on the 14 inch is better than any Windows laptop I've ever used. All you would need to know about battery life is that if you do light work like web browsing, light photo editing, consuming content, or word processing, it'll last about a whole average workday. If you're playing games or working with intense apps like Blender or Final Cut Pro, expect three to four hours of straight work before you have to whip out the charger. Keep in mind that the M1 Max chip, if you decide to choose it, is more powerful but will produce more heat and will also result in less battery life than the M1 Pro chip. Now, the most compelling feature about the M1 Pro MacBook Pro 14 inch is not any of those features alone, but the price. You can find this model now on sale for as low as $15.99. That is an insane value for the performance you're getting. Keep in mind that the latest M2 Pro MacBook Pro 14 inch starts at $400 more and up if you upgrade things like storage. And for what? HDMI 2.1? 20% more performance? The MacBook Pro 14 inch has another five to six years of software updates and its current price point is the best MacBook Pro I can recommend to anyone looking to do some serious work on a budget that's under $2,000. Also, the base model M2 Pro has a slower SSD than the base model 14 inch M1 Pro, so that is also something to consider if you're gonna consider this year's model. So, is the late 2021 14 inch MacBook Pro worth it? The reason I even made this video is to tell you that the answer is in a resounding yes. In fact, I regret not upgrading sooner. But for you, the consumer, this is the best year to buy this model as it is now discounted and still very, very relevant in power. It can handle intense work, but also just feels so good for everyday things like web browsing and consuming content because of the beautiful display, keyboard, and build quality. Save money and make the smart purchasing decision and get this laptop. If you guys enjoyed this content, make sure to hit like this video and subscribe so I can continue to make videos that I hope can help people with their tech decisions. Until next time, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Wow!